Sometimes even good people can make a mistake. And when it happens, it's one of the most intense and emotional experiences of your life. It could be a DUI, or maybe you were in the wrong place with the wrong people at the wrong time. Or perhaps you just did something stupid at the spur of the moment without even thinking, and now you're in trouble with the law. Well, you need experienced legal help right away so you don't become a victim of the criminal justice system. Even good people can make a mistake, and if you, a friend or a loved one, has been accused of a crime, don't make another mistake by hiring the wrong attorney for the kind of help you need. You need to visit ToddJohnsLaw.com. That's ToddJohnsLaw.com, and then call Attorney Todd Johns today. Attorney Todd Johns has decades of experience helping good people like you who have made mistakes or bad decisions and will stand by you every step of the way. ToddJohnsLaw.com. All right. Hello and welcome to That's Enough Out of You. This is a weekly podcast hosted by me, Bill Rader, and my co-host, Sean Kane. Sean, what's going on? How are you doing today? Billy Raids, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing all right. Can't complain. Um, doing pretty good. So we have a, uh, a very uh, special guest with us today, uh, Mr. Joseph McBride, who is an author um, has has authored many 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 books, including um, a biography of, of uh, Steven Spielberg, um, a uh, a book on on Orson Welles, a book on John Ford, and um, the book that that we're going to uh, talk to him today about is called uh, Into the Nightmare: um, I Search for the Killers of President John F. Kennedy and Officer J D. Tippett, um, which he published in 2013. So, um, Joe, welcome to That's Enough Out of You. Be with you. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Great to have you. So, Sean, um, I, you know, this has been the the Tippet um, killing has always, for me, been the one thing that you know when when I talk to people who who kind of don't believe in any of the conspiracy uh, theories or or any you know anything outside of the the lone gunman theory, they always say, "Well, well, why did he kill the police officer?" Um, and Sean, I know we're going to dive into that today. We're going to dive real deep into that today. So why don't we get started with that? Well, um, you know, and I want to say, you know, it is kind of the missing piece of the puzzle. But Joe, your books, I, I've been a big fan of your work. And uh, your your book, uh, Into the Nightmare, is pro probably the best, uh, and actually, no doubt, the best book on, on the tip of murder. Um, so before we get started and we get into that, you want to just give a little bio yourself, Joe, and, and plug some of your books? Well, thank you. Yeah, you mentioned some. Uh, I, I'm primarily a film historian, although I regard my study of the Kennedy assassination as my true mission in life. I've been studying it since uh, 10 minutes after it happened. And actually, I even before it happened, I, I wrote a short story about the Kennedy assassination in October 1961 when I was a freshman in high school in Milwaukee. Because I, I had been a volunteer for Kennedy in his Wisconsin presidential primary campaign. Right. I met him twice during that campaign. I was uh, up wow. close with him and I was uh, struck by his lack of security. I was worried about that. And I was already a student of the Lincoln assassination and the Civil War. And so I wrote a short story called The Plot Against a Country, um, kind of a juvenile story, but it, it went into um, details of the plot and autopsy and things like that and so when he was shot i was not totally surprised uh, you know and since then we've been living with uh, a, a constant fear of assassinations of right. presidents, presidents and presidential candidates and other politicians and, uh, but i, I uh, my, my life has been spent uh, writing books about film history i've done uh, Besides the Spielberg biography, I did a biography of John Ford. I did a biography of Frank Capra. And uh, I, I've recently done critical studies of Ernst Lubitsch and Billy Wilder. I have a book coming out this December called George Cukor's People, Acting for a Master Director. He's one of the greatest directors and a fabulous director of actors. So I've written about the actors and their performances. Uh, 
and I uh, teach uh, in the School of Cinema at San Francisco State University. But uh, besides Into the Nightmare, I wrote a book in 2021 called Political Truth, the Media and the Assassination of President Kennedy, which I'm very proud of. And uh, I've been a journalist since 1960 as well. I sold my first magazine article then. And I've been writing for newspapers and magazines my whole life. <clears throat> and uh, I'm a critic of the media. And I think, you know, I teach courses in that. I, I try to teach students to be critical of what they read in the, the media because we're lied to a lot. And, and Absolutely. It's a prime uh, subject that we're constantly lied to about by the New York Times and the Washington Post and TV networks, et cetera. It's, uh, it's kind of heretical and uh, mainstream media to uh, question the assassination story, the official story, which is uh, ludicrous when you really study the, the meager eight, eight proofs. Uh, Warren, Warren report had eight proofs, supposedly, that Kennedy was shot by Oswald. And one of the proofs was Oswald shot Tippett. And that's a, that doesn't make sense because just if he shot Tippett, it, it, does not, it doesn't mean he shot the president, you know, sure. is logical. He could have, if he had shot Tippett, which I don't think he did, he could have shot him for some other reason. But uh, what I found in my research, um, I interviewed a lot of people in, in Dallas, uh, including Henry Wade, the DA, and uh, Jim Lavelle, who was the lead detective in the Tippett case. And Lavelle told me, and Wade confirmed that. Uh, they didn't really have much of a case, if anything, on Oswald for killing Kennedy. So Wade, uh, 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 Will Fritz, the captain of homicide, told Lavelle on the night of the 22nd, we got to wrap him up on the Tippett murder because we don't really have a case on the Kennedy murder. And so it, that was used to convince the public, you know, as, as you kind of alluded to, that a lot of people think, well, he shot a policeman, he was fleeing, you know, why would he shoot a policeman unless he was desperate and fleeing another crime? And that's what a lot of people think. And so it worked very well as a kind of propaganda thing. And we can talk about, you know, I asked Lavelle why, why they thought they had more of a case on the Tippett murder. And he said, well, we had witnesses. And that implies, number one, they didn't have any witnesses for Oswald shooting Kennedy, even though they claimed they had one. Um, but also, the witnesses in the, in the Tippett shooting are a complete chaos. You know, chaos, because, right. it's all over the map. That's one of the big problems with the case. Well, let's let's get into it, Joe. Let's let's talk about because you know you book is one of the only ones that really focus on the Tippett murder. So many researchers don't do a, a lot of focus on the Tippett murder. But let's talk about, let's talk about, let's start because I want to get into this background. I want to get into the Dallas PD. Uh, a lot of the, the officers, you know, their, their backgrounds, because I think that's important. And some of the interviews you had with some Dallas PD officers, including Lavelle is, is important, but let's start with uh, the actual like official story of J.D. Tippett. And, and what what they actually say, because am I correct in saying that um, the Warren Commission says that Tippett was shot at one sixteen, but his death certificate says one fifteen. So how is that possible? It's a you know the timing is one of the key elements in the case. Um, they they had to um, lie about when he was shot in order to give Oswald time to get from his rooming house to the right. scene. And Oswald was seen at his rooming house in Oak Cliff, which is a suburb of Dallas, uh, at about one o'clock by his um, housekeeper. He came in briefly, went in his room, stayed for just a minute or two and left. And then she saw him standing on the corner waiting uh, for some, something, if a uh, bus or whatever, at about 103, 104. And uh, the Tippett shooting actually occurred around probably 108 or 109, maybe as early as 106. It depends on uh, certain pieces of evidence. Uh, there's a witness named T.F. Boley, who I interviewed. Uh, he said I was the first person who ever interviewed him, uh, although he had, he had talked to the Dallas police and he had talked to a House Select Committee investigator, but that was it. But he gave me a very thorough interview. He's the only person who looked at his watch at the time. And at the Tippett scene, he looked. He came upon the, the scene. He was driving down a nearby road, and he saw this 
police car and this policeman lying in the street. And he turned his car and parked a few car lengths down because he had his young daughter in the car and didn't want her to see it, but she saw it anyway. But he said it was 110 when he looked at his watch. So Tippett had to have been shot before 110, at least. And there were already people there. And uh, so the Warren Commission um, deliberately fudged the, the uh, transcripts of the police recordings. They had three different transcripts of the police recordings, police radio, and they also fiddled with the um, documentation about the time of death. Uh, there was a, a document about the, the doctor pronouncing him dead at 115 at Methodist Hospital, which is very close to the scene. And, and they, you can see that in the document, somebody types a two over the one in wow. the one. 15 to 1, make, make it 125 that he was uh, pronounced dead, and it was really 115. And the ambulance uh, was right around the corner, just a few blocks down. It was like it, it arrived in about two minutes or so after they were called, and uh, it got to the hospital in just a, two or three minutes, so the timing was pretty fast. But, uh, th th you know, that exonerates Oswald, for one thing. Uh, nobody saw him on the route between the rooming house and the Tippett shooting scene. But even more so, the ballistics evidence exonerates Oswald because um, the bullets found in the officer, uh, an FBI expert who was honest testified to the Warren Commission that he couldn't match them with the revolver that was taken allegedly from Oswald at the theater when he was captured about half an hour later. And he couldn't couldn't match them. And there were also problems with uh, the, the gunman allegedly emptied his uh, pistol as he was walking along and dumped the shells on the grass, which is strange. You know, if you're if you're a gunman, why would you would why would you leave evidence like that? Right. There was a wallet found at the scene with Oswald's identification. You know, it seems like a, a lot of the evidence was planted by the Dallas police. It was, they were very corrupt. And then the Warren Commission was not conducting an honest investigation, neither was the FBI. So this case is just full of uh, false leads and false information. So that, uh, one reason I studied it, um, Sean, you know, um, a, a lot of people had ignored the Tippett murder and the, even the Warren Commission, um, I found a memo Back in the days, I, you know, I, I researched into the nightmare for 30 years, seriously. And I used to go to the National Archives in Washington, which, you know, before the Internet, you had to go there and it was expensive. And I found a document um, that um, uh, indicated, uh, no, oh, uh, what were we talking I'm sorry, there was. That's all right. What was the um, point I was, I was talking about there? I'm sorry. Was it about the timeline? Um, no, it well, it was a different document. I was right uh, about the ballistics. Was the ballistics something to do with the ballistics evidence? Well, there was a lot of pro there were a lot of problems with the ballistics, and also John Armstrong wrote a terrific book called Harvey and Lee. Yes, uh, two Oswalds, which sounds right. kind of far out when you know if you first think about it, but it's not unusual in um, spycraft to have more than one person using an identity. And Armstrong has long chapters on, on the gun that allegedly was used to shoot Tippett and also the rifle that was allegedly used to shoot Kennedy. And he proves that Oswald didn't own either one. There's no actual verifiable proof that Oswald owned either one of those weapons. So there's, there's really no proof linking him to the Tippett murder, except for witnesses who said, yeah, it was Oswald and... Uh, uh, there were about 20 people who were around there, like at the time or shortly thereafter, and about 10 identified Oswald and about 10 didn't. Some said there were two men at the scene. Right. Some said there was the guy who shot him was a short, heavy set, bushy guy, haired guy, which Oswald was not. Right. Um, when you mentioned before about the housekeeper, now, when Oswald was was at the rooming house, she said that a uniform, two uniform cops pulled up in a in a police car and stopped in front of the house and, and beeped a horn. Correct? Yeah, 
that's suspicious. And um, she uh, she gave a number for the police car. And it, it it's not clear who that was in the police car. And there are different uh, theories. One one is that it was Tippett. Uh, and another, John Armstrong, is continuing to investigate the Tippett case. One thing that you do when, when you write a book, I like to... Uh, stimulate other people to, to do research. Oh, I know the point I was going to make. Uh, back in the day, yes, this is the document I found at the National Archives. There was a woman named Alfreda Scobie, who was okay. a lawyer who was working for the Warren Commission. She was a protege of Senator Richard Russell, and he was on the commission, and he was a skeptic about the case and uh, never really believed the single bullet theory. And he had her on she was a very uh, good lawyer from Georgia who uh, he had her there as his kind of eyes and ears. And she wrote a memo in, um, I think it was around March of 1964 to Jay Lee Rankin, the head of the Warren Commission. And, he, and uh, she said, you know, nobody's in, uh, investigating the Tippett case. Aren't we supposed to investigate the Tippett case? And, I mean, it's, it's amazing. They, they hadn't even looked into it. Right. So Rankin then asked J. Edgar Hoover, have the FBI investigate Tippett. So the FBI about a week later produced a, a report, which was just a lot of facts about Tippett that were, uh, you know, important, but they interviewed a few family members and got the basic facts about his life, et cetera. Um, but they didn't really do an investigation of his murder, uh, except to just say Oswald did it, and a very cursory investigation. The same thing, the House, House Select Committee did a little more investigation of it, and turned up a few facts, but uh, not enough. And um, Gary Murr uh, had written a book in 1971 about Tippett's murder, a short book that was not printed, uh, not published, but it, it circulated. And it's a pretty good, pretty good first effort. But that was all that people had written when I was doing my research. Dale Myers came up with the book called With Malice, which I regard as the Warren Report of the Tippett case. He's, yeah. he's up. It's the title already, uh, you know, indicts Oswald for killing Tippett with malice. Um, and he uh, does everything possible to prove that Oswald shot Tippett. And uh, any inconvenient evidence he, he often puts in the back in little footnotes and then dismisses them, you know. And uh, so that was it on the Tippett case. It, it had been an underreported part of the assassination study. And Penn Jones, who was a first-generation researcher who was a uh, independent newspaper editor and publisher in Midlothian, Texas, which is outside Dallas, he's a very feisty, independent guy, really good journalist, and he was a mentor of mine. I, I, I got to know him in 1983 in Dallas, and mm -hmm. that his advice to me and other researchers was take one aspect of the case, one that hasn't been covered uh, adequately and research the hell out of it, which is what I did with Tippett. And so I I, um, I I kind of called people's attention again to the Tippett murder and got people focused on this. Um, David Bellin, who is one of the Warren Commission lawyers, right. staunch defender of the Warren Commission, um, he, he said the Rosetta Stone of the assassination is the Tippett murder. Wow. And that he meant that the the solution of the assassination lies in the Tippett murder, which again yeah. is kind of a non sequitur because it doesn't, even if you could prove Oswald shot Tippett, it doesn't prove he killed Kennedy. No, no. no. Bell right. even thought maybe the two incidents were unrelated. Uh, that's another thing we can go into. But um, I think it's the Rosetta Stone for different reasons. I think it helps, helps understand why the Kennedy assassination took place. So, you're saying that Tippett Tippett was shot before 110. Now, when does Oswald? What one of the first reports putting Oswald in the Texas theater, which is where he was arrested? Well, he was arrested uh, around 151, and they they started reporting. Um, well, it's it's after 130. Uh, there were reports. Uh, that a person had snuck into the theater without paying. That, that, I, you know, it's kind of astounding that like dozens of police cars showed up because the guy hadn't paid for a ticket, supposedly, yeah. which is a false story anyway. So it was between uh, 
135 and, and 151 cars started pulling up and they arrested Oswald at the theater. And, uh, but what was he doing in the meantime has is, is never been totally clear. But he was at the theater, and uh, the second Oswald was uh, evidently arrested at the theater, too. In the ball. There, there were a couple of police reports to say that Oswald was arrested in the balcony, and uh, the guy we know as Oswald was pulled out of the main floor. Right. And there were uh, movies of them being, and pictures of them being pulled out. And, uh, but in the, the guy who was arrested in the balcony was let go and he was let out the back door and uh, armstrong believes that the two oswalds were in the theater i don't i, I have some questions and differences with uh, uh, armstrong i'm not sure why they would have both of them there yeah. uh risk exposing this uh spy plot that they had going on but uh, it is clear that there was somebody who looked like oswald who was arrested at the same time and let go and uh there were witnesses who identified him as Oswald, you know. What was the first time, though, that the, that the witnesses seen him actually enter the Texas theater? Because that's important in respect to the time that, that Tippa was actually shot, because the distance is too far for him to get from the theater, to the, from the crime scene to the theater. There was a fellow named Butch Burroughs who worked at the theater, and he was the guy who took tickets and sold the candy and popcorn. And he he gave interviews and he said that um, Oswald entered the theater. I think he said around one oh six or thereabouts. Wow, you know, and he was sitting in the theater. They were showing uh, coming attractions and cartoons and things like that. And I think the movie began at one twenty. So he claimed that Oswald was there, and he seemed like a reliable witness. And uh, so that would disprove the idea that Oswald could have been at the Tippett scene also. And now when Oswald is in the theater, there's reports that he's he's acting like a spy. He's going around. There was only a few people, I believe, like a dozen or so people in there. And he was talking to different people, moving his moving around in different seats uh, and talking to one. One lady was a pregnant lady and he was saying stuff. And there was also uh, John Armstrong reported that they found uh, two half dollar bills on him, which is which is a spy craft. You know, when you meet your contact, you, you, he has the other half of the bill. Yeah, I think there were 22 patrons in the theater, and uh, okay. they took a list of the names, but unfortunately that list conveniently vanished. It would be uh, really important if we had that. But uh, a few of the uh, patrons were, were located later, and they, they did describe Oswald as moving around. And it was a very large theater, held about 700 People, but it was you know small afternoon crowd and he was moving from place to place and sitting next to people there was a guy who later became an evangelist who was a, a teenager at the time and he said oswald came and sat next to him which he thought was kind of weird you know and and then he he got up and left and he did sit next to a pregnant woman for a while which as right. people there was a pregnant woman going to a 120 screening of a war movie war movie yeah <laughs> And, and most suspiciously, when, after Oswald uh, sat next to her and then he moved away, she left, you know, so she right. just, you know, she could have been his contact. And the thing with the, the dollar bills, that is, a, as you say, spycraft and uh, dollar bill uh, fragment was photographed by the police and then it disappeared from evidence. And so you would, if you would sit down and, and you would show your half of the dollar bill, your contact would show the other half, and then you know who it was, you know. Right. So, Joe, talk about uh, let's let's talk about the the ten minutes before Tippett's uh, killed. Some of the things he was doing, he's he's running around kind of frantically. Um, he goes in the t uh, top ten record store, makes a phone call. He's driving around like he's looking for somebody, and wasn't it? Tippett's wife that would later say that um, uh, Dallas police had him on orders uh, to track down and hunt Oswald? Yeah, uh, one of the major discoveries I made, I interviewed Edgar Lee Tippett, who was Tippett's father. Right. A year old man, very vigorous, very sharp fellow. He was still working as a farmer in East Texas. I drove out there and, boy, that was a desolate area. There, were, I drove through towns that were deserted, you know, it was kind of like the Great Depression, you know, and Mr. Tippett was uh, very 
nice man and uh, you know we had a good talk and he was a pretty open guy and he told me that um, Marie Tippett the widow of the police officer told him soon after the assassination that a fellow officer had come to see her to explain what happened and I deduced that this was William Mensel who was a former partner of Tippett, who was the guy who was assigned to patrol the district in which Tippett was shot. Tippett was out of his district by several miles, which is uh, interesting in itself. But yeah. Mansell told uh, Marie that he and J.D. had been assigned by the police to track down Lee Harvey Oswald, and they, they had his name. Wow. And they around Oak Cliff trying to find him shortly after the assassination. And it was as early as 1245, probably even earlier. So within 15 minutes of the assassination, J.D. was hunting for Oswald. And that's very important to know because yeah. it involves Tippett and Menzel in, in the uh, conspiracy. Because also, I mean, why were they hunting down Oswald either to arrest him or maybe kill him? Kill him, yeah. People think that the plan would have I been to a shootout on the street uh, or uh, failing that at the theater but the, Oswald had a lot of presence of mind at the theater and start shouting yeah I, I'm not resisting resisting arrest so they had to haul him out yeah. and actually for the police he was alive for two days as Dwight McDonald said he his miraculous survival for 48 hours in the custody of the Dallas police is the way he put it um but anyway, uh, Tippett and Mensel, the fact that the Dallas police knew who Oswald was is a sign of, uh, it's not It's not what the Warren Commission believed because the, the Warren Commission believed they didn't know who Oswald was until they arrested him at the theater. And they claimed that his wallet had two different identifications, one for Oswald and one for uh, a, A.J. Heidel, his alias that he sometimes used. And uh, Armstrong believes that the, the wallet they pulled from Oswald uh, in the police car didn't have the Heidel identification that it was put in later, you know, to try to link him to the gun because the, the rifle was ordered in the name of A.J. Heidel. And another mm -hmm. problem is if, if uh, Oswald uh, ordered the rifle in the name of A.J. Heidel, as the Warren Commission says, sent to a post office box he couldn't have obtained the rifle because you if you have a post office box somebody else can't use your box you know uh, if it's a name of Heidel and you say hi I'm Oswald I want the mail they wouldn't give it to you you know especially right. a gun package um, but anyway a Tippett and, and Mensel were chasing around Oak Cliff uh, the Dallas police knew who Oswald was they had a squad called the special service bureau which was sort of their red squad police off, uh, departments back in the cold war period would have um units assigned to track down subversives and com communist sympathizers and people of that sort you know and uh, oswald was on their list they knew they had his addresses he had moved around different addresses and there are documents showing that they had an old address for him at, at one point, but they knew that he lived in Oak Cliff by 1245. So that, that shoots down a lot of what the Warren Commission says. And, yeah. And so Tippett was seen at a uh, gas station uh, at 1245 by five witnesses who knew him. And this gas station, there was a viaduct that led from Oak Cliff straight to downtown. And under good circumstances, you can drive that in about five minutes, but on that day, it might have taken 10, 15. But Tippett was watching the viaduct probably for the bus that he thought Oswald would be on. And But Os the bus came by and Oswald was not on it, but Tippett followed the bus for a while. And then he took off at a high rate of speed and started driving around Oak Cliff. And... Um, I'll t we can talk about what happened with Oswald. But meanwhile, Tippett went to this record store, the Top Ten Records, which is very near the theater on Jefferson Boulevard, the main drag in uh, Oak Cliff. And um, he ran into the, uh, the uh, uh, record store, and they have a uh, telephone. It's still there on the, on the counter. And he 
got people to move out of the way and he picked up the phone, dialed a number, didn't say anything. He listened, put down the phone and ran out in a big hurry. And, and uh, wow. the clerk and the owner of the store knew Tippett from sight. He had been in there before and they, they saw him running out and then his car took off again very fast. Or 10th Street, that was the street he was killed on. But he uh, he encountered uh, a car driven by a man named James Andrews, who was an insurance man. And he pulled this car over right. in a movie and um, uh, jumped out and uh, looked in the back seat and didn't find anybody. And Andrews saw the name plate Tippett. And Tippett ran back into his car and took off, didn't say anything. And then he was next seen just very shortly after that getting killed, you know, uh, a few blocks down. Now, the witness, there's witnesses that see the suspect talking to Tippett, and it, uh, there was fingerprints found on the top of the car, correct? But they did not match Oswald. Well, yeah, they, they could not link um, Oswald to any fingerprints. They did take fingerprints off the car, but there was no match ever indicated. And so, um, but there were, um, there was the main witness that the Warren Commission relied on was very dubious, Helen Markham, who was a waitress who was kind of frantic and confused on the scene. And uh, she she had been walking to her bus. She was supposed to catch a 112 bus, which is another indicator that the shooting didn't happen at 115. And she was walking there and she was on a, corner, catty corner to where the shooting took place. She said she saw the whole thing, although some people think she she didn't actually see the shooting but came upon it shortly thereafter. But she said um, she identified Oswald as the shooter, but she was hysterical at the scene. And uh, Lavelle told me when he took her into the lineup to identify Oswald, she kept passing out. He had to keep using smelling salts. You know, she was... Uh, was hysterical and um, her testimony to the Warren Commission is farcical because uh, they thought she would identify, she would say I identified Oswald and she kept not identifying Oswald in her testimony and, and the, the um, uh, attorney kept leading her. He finally had to say, didn't you see the number two man in there? Wasn't that number two Oswald? And, oh yes, that was Oswald. Uh, but she said the shooting took place at 106, so she contradicted the official story, but the Warren Commission wouldn't wouldn't believe her. But one thing has come out, another thing has come out, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pleased that other people are digging into things. There's a fellow named Gavin McMahon, who's a researcher in Australia, former law enforcement guy, and he's, he's contacted members of uh, Markham's family. She's dead now, but um, he found out that she was paid to be there by Jack Ruby. And uh, wow. she's a wow. paid witness to be on the scene. And she, they kept paying her sums afterwards and threatening her. Also, uh, they and the police had things on her because she had two sons who were in trouble with the law. One of them had been um, in the state prison and he had gotten out soon before. And then he went back into state prison soon after this. The police had this kind of control over her because of her, her sons who were uh, petty criminals. And um, uh, according to McMahon's sources in the, in the Markham family, um, I don't know if I believe this, but the, the, the son James Markham was part of a gang in Oak Cliff that would do break-ins of phones. And they claim that Oswald was part of this gang, which I find kind of hard to believe. But yeah. I knew Oswald. But anyway, Mrs. Markham, the thing that's, that rings true to me is um, Jerry Rose, who was a good researcher, did an article back in the 90s for an assassination magazine. And he's, he theorized that the Tippett murder scene was staged by Jack Ruby. And because several of the witnesses were associated with Jack Ruby. And right. He, there in his and, it was in his neighborhood basically his neighborhood was only a couple blocks away his apartment if you know some people say oswald was en route to jack ruby's apartment right which was very nearby <laughs> and uh, there were people who had seen oswald at ruby's apartment etc 
And uh, other people say he Oswald was coming from a different direction altogether. Uh, there were witnesses who said he was walking toward the police car instead of, you know, from behind the police car. And um, that's confusing. I mean, there's so much confusion about the, the witness reports at the tip of scene. It's like Rashomon, you know, the Japanese classic work. Uh, right. Uh, it takes place mm -hmm. in stories don't match. And, um, that is to be expected to some extent in most crimes, but in this case, there are people who are lying and and uh, told to be there. For and another thing, McMahon discovered is uh, Scoggins, the cab driver, um, was sitting in his cab eating lunch right around the corner from the tippet shooting, and he saw part of it taking place. And the the shooter walked past him. And he identified the shooter as Oswald. And uh, according to McMahon, Scoggins was paid by Jack Ruby to be there too. Wow. And Foley, the fellow I mentioned who came upon the scene and and uh, looked at his watch, and he was a uh, professional radio guy, uh, worked for an electronics company. And he was the one who called in the police report because Benavides, who is the closest witness to the shooting, who didn't who wouldn't identify Oswald until three years later. Uh, and that was after something happened to his twin brother, correct? Well, he had a brother who looked like him. Right. Uh, okay. They looked a lot of like the brother who was shot to death in a right. box in Dallas in 64. And Benavides in 66 identified Oswald to CBS. But, you know, three year later, identification under duress is suspicious. But um, Bowley came upon the scene. Benavides was trying to call in on the police radio and he didn't know how to use it. So Bowley took the police radio and called it in. You could hear his voice on the recordings. And uh, so, uh, but Bowley, he was very forthcoming with me. And he told me he knew Jack Ruby. He said everybody knew Jack Ruby in Dallas. He was a nice fellow, blah, blah, blah. He didn't tell me, though, that he had worked for Jack Ruby for several years in one of his clubs. Wow. He was a doorman or bouncer, I guess you'd call it. And he left that fact out. That came out years later when he was given uh, an award by the city of Dallas belatedly for his actions that day. So you have several uh, Ruby connections. There are other people at the scene who had uh, connections with Ruby. Uh, also, Mrs. Markham, for example, the star witness, worked at a cafe downtown, which was very close to Ruby's carousel club. And Ruby would come in and eat there all the time. And his uh, guy he lived with, George Senator, would eat there all the time. And that night, a night of the 22nd, Ruby went into the Eatwell Cafe and asked, was Mrs. Markham there? And he, he bought a coffee and they said, no, she's not there. And then he put some money down and left in a big hurry. So he was going to talk to her. So he knew her quite well, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Markham. And so, so the scene is kind of polluted with uh, staged people. And even Ruby himself might have been, he could have been the bushy-haired guy that Mrs. Uh, Clements saw. Right. Yeah. Um, Joe, we, we do need to pause real quick just um, to take a break. And then when we come back, I know, Sean, you've got some uh, follow up questions on the Jack Ruby connection. And I actually have some questions myself. So we're going to pause just real quick. We'll be right back. And we would like to thank our sponsor, Gracious Day Grains. Uh, Sean, you like to eat healthy, don't you? Always, buddy. I try to eat healthy as much as I can. Yeah, and there is nothing healthier than uh, what they call like farm to table, right? This so when you when you can get something right from the ground and and make it and then put it right on your table. Um, and Gracious Day Grains, they have a tremendous selection, it, and it's totally organic. Everything is, you know, they don't use any sort of herbicides or pesticides or anything like that. They have. Um, a bunch of different uh, different products on their website, Gracious Day Grain. So if you go to graciousdaymilling.com, uh, you, you'll find a, a bunch of great stuff there, Sean. Yeah, you will, Billy. And, and it's owned by Tom Maxey, who's a, who's a great guy from Virginia. Um, he's a truth seeker, just like uh, me and you, buddy. And uh, Tom's growing philosophy follows the wisdom of farmers of centuries past. And a quote from Tom is, 
If we practice the right rotations, we exclude the bugs and weeds without needing herbicides or pesticides. So, I mean, this is great, Billy. I mean, what he's doing is fantastic. There's cornbread mix. There's cornmeal, popcorn. He sells buckwheat pan. Sean, have you had buckwheat pancakes? Have no, buddy. Oh my, they're delicious. I love buckwheat pancakes. And they, and and gracious, uh, gracious day grain sells buckwheat pancakes. Just go to their website, and and you know you'll be able to find all of this stuff there. You can order it right off the website. You can find out all about how they how they farm and, and their whole philosophy. Tom's philosophy is great stuff. It really is, Billy. And one of the things he does is he grinds small batches at, at very low temperatures, which retains the flavor and the freshness. Of course, and and it, I mean, you can't get any fresher than that. I mean, it's right, literally right from the ground. So again, go to graciousdaymilling.com and just you know take a look on there. You can order whatever you want and, and they'll they'll send it right to your door Can't, i mean again it just it doesn't get any doesn't get any fresher than that right from tom's farm to your door to your table so absolutely and eat healthy eat healthy and you'll feel better absolutely i wish i could do that i wish i could eat healthier sean I'm, well start with tom's stuff buddy I, i'm going to i'm going to order some of those buckwheat pancakes i love there making, you go I love i'm going to try them too billy yeah they're really good all right gracious day we thank gracious day grains for their sponsorship Thank you. Okay. So Sean, I know you had some uh, some follow-up questions on the on the connection to Ruby. Right. Well, that's what I want to talk about. It seems like Joe in your book, it seems like everybody in in Tippett's orbit is connected to Jack Ruby and and there's a lot of connections between Tippett Ruby and Oswald and one of them was this this fellow um Austin Cook that owned this Austin barbecue where Tippett worked part time. Uh, so let's talk about some of those connections and, and let's talk about this fellow uh, uh, Austin Cook. Yeah, there was this uh, very uh, interesting uh, barbecue joint, Austin's Barbecue, which was right around the corner from the local police substation where Tippett worked out of. And it was a hangout for all the cops. And I interviewed Austin Cook, an uh, amiable fellow, and he told me he had been a member of the John Birch Society, which was a far right group at the time. Yeah. And he employed Tippett as a security guard on weekends uh, to control the teenagers who would come in on Friday and Saturday nights, and Tippett would moonlight. And he had a kind of bad reputation among the teenagers, He's kind of a rough character pushing them around and kind of a jerk, you know. And um, but Austin's was a hangout for a lot of the right wingers in, in uh, Dallas. Uh, for one thing, Austin had been in business with Ralph Paul, who was a mysterious character with right. connections, who was Jack Ruby's financial backer. financial backer, right? He was the backer wow. of Jack Ruby's nightclubs. Ralph Paul and uh, Austin Cook had owned a uh, business together uh, before Austin's Barbecue split off, and Austin went off on his own. And so Ralph Paul was a familiar figure there. And that's another Ruby Tippett connection, pretty close. And people would come in like Bill Alexander was the deputy DA who was this extreme right winger who was all over the place uh, at the Tippett. Uh, he was hunting down uh, the Tippett killer, et cetera. And he was at the theater and, and uh, he thought there was a conspiracy involved. He's, I, I interviewed him briefly, but he got he got really angry at me and refused to talk to me anymore. But we we <laughs> talked. But so some of the right wing extremists in town would hang out at Austin. So Tippett had he'd been there for two years, and uh, so he had ways of meeting people there. If you know how would Tippett have been brought into the conspiracy? Well, these guys would see a policeman around, and you know they would think, okay, well, let's get this guy involved. It, it, it's quite uh, reasonable to. To assume that's where they made the connection. Um, uh, there are a lot of things about Tippett which are kind of unusual. He didn't make much money. I think his salary was four hundred and thirty-five dollars a month, and uh, but they they owned two homes, which was unusual. They had owned a home and then they moved to another home, but they kept the first home and they rented it out, and so they're paying mortgages on two homes, and uh, he. Um, he bought a station wagon in the months before the assassination, and his father told him he bought him a truck, you know, pickup truck. 
and uh, he came in with some money and um, he was moonlighting to, I guess, pay the uh, mortgages on these two homes, which is a And lot he had a money. reputation as a womanizer too, right? Womanizer. I, I interviewed his mistress, Johnny Maxie Witherspoon, who was identified in the house investigation. And we had a very frank interview. She was a very candid lady. Um, she had a, she was a waitress at Austin's Barbecue, and she wasn't the only woman who was involved in it. She said there were more before me and more after me, but she was involved with Tippett sexually, she told me, for a couple of years, and uh, they would meet. She wouldn't tell me where they would meet, but Austin thought they would meet at the back of his restaurant, you know, for sexual encounters. And um, uh, they were, she was estranged from her husband, Steve Thompson, who was an uh, angry, jealous guy. And he supposedly was following Tippett and Johnny Maxey around out of jealousy. And some people even have suspected Steve Thompson shot Tippett. Wow, interesting. Wow. Go ahead. Well, um, there's a fellow in Dallas, Greg Lowry, is a really good investigator. He's been on the case for a long time. And before him, Larry Ray Harris, who I interviewed, also very helpful. Both, both these guys were helpful. And that, that's what researchers do. You know, we're a community. We kind of help each other out. It's kind of like a relay race, you know. So right. Larry, unfortunately, died in a car crash in the 90s. But he gave me a lot of leads, and uh, he didn't think uh, he and Greg kind of resist the idea that Tippett was corrupt. But you know, I mean, I found out from Tippett's father who's involved in conspiracy, and there, and, and that wasn't exactly news because that had been speculated since the beginning. Sure, Thomas Buchanan wrote a book in 1964 speculating that Tippett was somehow involved in conspiracy, but nobody ever had that kind of proof, you know. And we can talk about Mrs. Tippett gave an alibi for her husband uh, that he came home for lunch right. at 11.30ish and left around, well, the problem with her story is her times changed frequently when she told the story over the years. Uh, he came home at you know, 11.15, 11.30, 11.45, he left at 12, he left you know, after 12, et cetera. And the stories kept changing, which I thought was interesting. You know, as a reporter, when stories change, it raises a red flag for me. And um, there was a lady across the street who claimed that she had seen Tippett pulling out of his driveway and she said hi to him. But I, I interviewed her at length and I managed to shoot down her story that I think she had confused an earlier uh sighting of Tippett. It wasn't that day. She couldn't, the story didn't jive, you know. Right. This is Tippett um, said JD came home for lunch that day and, and then he had to go back to work. But that was, his home was about, I think, seven miles from where he was killed. So he's pretty far from home. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a big day with all kinds of activity with the president of town and everything, even though he wasn't assigned to downtown. Um, you know, going home for lunch uh, was, you know, she also gave conflicting stories how often he came home for lunch. Sometimes she said he did it a lot. Sometimes she said he didn't do it very often, et cetera. You know, so th that story is kind of question mark in my mind. I, I couldn't interview Mrs. Tippett. I, I wrote her a letter and she didn't respond. And then after my book came out, I she was appearing at the Sixth Floor Museum, which is the former Texas School Book Repository. In 2014, JD's 90th birthday, Mrs. Tippett and her surviving children, two of three children survived, um, went down uh, and gave a, a talk at, at the um, Sixth Floor Museum. So I met Mrs. Tippett and, and, and they had a little reception afterwards. And she was a very nice lady. And, uh, you know, I shook her hand and introduced myself as the author of a book on, on Kennedy and Tippett. And I said, could I interview you? I'm in town for a couple of days. Could I see you tomorrow? And she said, oh, yeah, sure. And she seemed very willing. But behind her was Gary Mack, who was this guy who was running the Sixth Floor Museum. Yeah. And he was a, um, a renegade character who had been a uh, supposedly serious researcher who didn't 
believed in the Warren Commission version. And then he got hired to, to run the Sixth War Museum. He totally flipped. And he totally flipped. You know, he sold out for, I guess it was a $200,000 salary. And so he was kind of playing a double game for years and sabotaging, uh, putting out stories, debunking researchers' claims, etc. Anyway, he was signaling behind my back to a cop who was nearby, who was Mrs. Tippett's handler. And Greg Lowry told me ever since the assassination, the Dallas police had a cop with Mrs. Tippett all the time. Wow. Uh, kind of protecting her and keeping people away from her. They didn't want people talking to her. You know? Right. So this cop came walking over and he said, oh, hi, and you know, I introduced myself. And I said, Mrs. Tippett told me she'd be happy to talk to me tomorrow and he said well you know i'm scheduling her interviews and you know i'll let you know give me your card and i'll get back to you and i knew i knew they wouldn't you know and so i had to go back to california without an interview with Mrs. Tippett. i wanted to ask her about the lunch and other things too i mean for example um there was this story um that Tippett had asked his wife for a divorce shortly before the assassination. She was very upset. But Johnny Maxie Witherspoon, I asked her about that, and she said, well, um, actually, she thought Mrs. Tippett had asked him for a divorce. She wanted a divorce because he was a womanizer, you know? And wow. so Mrs. Mrs. Tippett knew about these affairs, and she came into Austin's barbecue shortly after the assassination, and was all upset and demanded to see the waitress that JD was involved in. And also the waitress, Mrs. Witherspoon, had left some flowers on JD, JD's grave with an inscription that was something like, to the best man I ever knew. And that got Mrs. Tippett really upset and she was demanding to know who left the flowers. And mm -hmm. Johnny Maxey was not there at the time, but she said, well, I left the flowers. He was the best man I ever knew. And she, Mrs. Tippett even went to see Helen Markham, who was a waitress. Uh, and she thought maybe Helen Markham was the one having the affair with her husband, which was not the case. But she was she, she was very aware that her husband was cheating. Her. Wow. He was not the family man, good family man that the Warren Commission. And the police they painted him out to be, yeah. He was, a, he was a shady character. And there were stories. Alan Dulles brought up. The drug. Murray was testifying. For the Warren Commission, Alan Dulles said, what about the rumor that Tippett was involved in nar narcotics? And Curry said, oh, I never heard about that. But, you know, it's kind of a non-secretary that came out of blue. What was that about, you know? Right. Tippett was working at a different uh, theater as well, for, uh, not at the time of the assassination, but earlier. And the guy who ran that theater was involved in prostitution in Dallas and stuff. And wow. so it was around that corrupt milieu and the Dallas Police Department was a very corrupt department. I can yeah. tell you the Police Department, I did a lot of research. They were heavily involved in the assassination. That's what I want to talk about next. Let's, let's take a, a, another quick break here, uh, Billy, and then we'll come back. And I want to get into the Dallas Police Department and how a lot of these members of the Police Department were actually members of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, yeah, they were quite a, quite a bunch, huh? Yeah, so let's let's take a quick break, okay. Billy. Yeah. Do you need a new roof? Are you looking to repair damage to an existing roof? Call the roofing professionals at Quality Roofing Express. Located in Scranton, Pennsylvania, Quality Roofing Express is a certified Owens Corning contractor. We are an independent family-owned business connecting with our community and providing quality work. Our expert team can install metal roofs, rubber roofing, or traditional asphalt shingles. Do you need chimney flashing? How about a new skylight to increase your home's value and let that natural sunlight in? At Quality Roofing Express, we do it all, even siding. Check out our website, qualityroofingexpress.net, or visit us on Facebook. Give us a call at 570-614-3914 for a free estimate today. Quality Roofing Express. We put a roof over your head. DK's Corner has moved. 
Come see us in our brand new location at 201 Cherry Street in Jessup, Pennsylvania, right across from the Jessup Plaza. Enjoy a brand new menu with hot and cold sandwiches, soups, salads, pizza, delicious breakfast, including breakfast bowls and sandwiches, specialty coffees, and DK's famous Razzle Dazzle Flavor Shake and Espressos, and still the best cheese steaks around. Follow DK's Corner on Facebook and Instagram, or call them at 570-209-0278 to find out about their daily specials and catering. And DK's Corner now has beautiful outdoor seating for the summer. Don't feel like leaving the house? Call DK's Corner for delivery. And we thank DK's Corner for sponsoring That's Enough Out of You. DK's Corner, now in Jessup, Pennsylvania. That's Enough Out of You is also sponsored by Case Quattro Winery, featuring over 20 flavors of wine, from dry red, dry white, and fruit for your sampling pleasure. Case Quattro Winery offers entertainment, parties, and private events. Now serving a full menu with a little something for everyone, including appetizers, salads, dinners, pizza, and desserts. Case Quattro has some of the best live entertainment in the area, with comedy and karaoke nights and live bands. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram for all of our upcoming events. And if you mention the code OUTTA, that's O-U-T-T-A, you get 15% off of your order. Located on Main Street in Peckville, Pennsylvania, call 570-382-3855 for more information. And we thank Case Quattro Winery for their support. Let's get back into let's let's talk about the Dallas Police Department. A lot of the members were were Ku Klux Klan members. There was a lot of racism. There was a lot of corruption. And Joe, you interviewed a lot of these the uh, policemen. And uh, talk about the one was it Lavelle that told you that um, when Kennedy was killed, the the police really didn't feel anything about it. To them, it was just another. And I'm not going to use the racial epithet, but they used the N word. Another N South Dallas N word killing to them but when one of their own was killed now it was like we got to go after and hunt down the, this 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 murder that's a cop killer this guy so talk to me a little bit about that and, and about your interviews with the dallas police department yeah i i you know from the tape of the police tape you know when you listen to it they seem pretty uh business-like when kennedy is shot they're kind of you know matter of fact they're not very emotional on the tape yeah i heard one officer says, yeah, I heard his head was practically blown off. You know, he says it in a very matter-of-fact way. But then when when uh, somebody calls in and says an officer was shot, the, the pace gets increased. They get frantic and they very emotional. Oh, what, you know, a policeman shot? Oh, where, where was the video? You know, people, a lot of people jumping in. And so I said to uh, Jim Lavelle, the detective, uh, the head of the tippet investigation, uh, I said, uh, you know, I, I gleaned that they maybe were more upset about Tippett being killed than Kennedy. He's, he had this kind of little evil smile. And he had that line that was very shocking. He said, well, as the old saying goes, it wasn't no different than a South Dallas N-word shooting. Right. Unbelievable. Uh, I thought, Gee, huh. this, is, this is their attitude. And you, you heard yeah. this video when Robert Kennedy was shot that LA police were racist too. Right. Uh, like the Kennedys. And, and uh, they were very, uh, somebody calls in, Robert Kennedy was shot in, and this officer says, so what? You know, I mean, like really awful. Wow. So in Dallas, um, yeah, and, and he said it's true, and this is true of any police department, I suppose, that if an officer is killed, that that's the number one priority. You know? Sure. What is their, their guy, their partner? And uh, on the other hand, they didn't really um, care all that much about Tippett. They dropped the investigation after a couple of days. And uh, you'd think that, you know, your brother officer gets killed. You would really want to find out who shot him. And, and yeah. Arrested and they didn't really bother. And uh, but, but, you know, at, at the time they were extremely frantic. And that helps account for the huge manhunt going into Oak Cliff and that raises the question, why was Tippett killed? There are all kinds of ways to speculate about that. One simple speculation, uh, and it's part of why he was killed, I suppose, 
is that it, it diverted attention from the president's killing downtown and uh, where they should have been um, gathered, you know, to, to uh, get, uh, collect evidence and then try to find the suspect. But they uh, diverted so many officers to Oak Cliff. But if they said the suspect was there, the, the strange thing is uh, they were looking for the suspect in the policeman shooting, not the president's killing. But wow. some of the policemen, and I talked to some of them, they said, yeah, we assumed he did both. And then other people said, no, I didn't really make that assumption. It's not logical to assume that he did both, but it, it, it's possible if the policeman is shot 40 minutes later, maybe it's connected with the president's shooting. And there were witnesses in the theater who said uh, policemen were saying, yeah, we got we got the guy who did both uh, shootings, you know, and so they, they leaped to, leapt to that conclusion very quickly. And that, that's how they were. That's what they were meant to do. You know, but, he's a, but a cop sure. is the worst kind of guy to another policeman, you know, I mean, it threatens. Sure. Right. Joe, l- let me ask you a question. What in how many years have you been researching the, the Tippett murder? Well, you know, um, as I said, I 10 minutes after the Kennedy shooting, I was um, I was a junior in high school in Milwaukee, and I heard it in the cafeteria from a guy who said Kennedy was shot, and I laughed involuntarily, and he, I could tell he was serious. So I, I spun around and ran to a radio, and I knew there was a radio in a drugstore, and I, it was like two minutes away, and I listened there for 40 minutes from 12.40 to 1.30, and then I had to go back to class. Uh, but the interesting thing was from 12.40 to 1 o'clock, all the reports on the network radio stations were saying the shots came from the front, either from the railroad bridge or the, the hill in front mm. of the, called the grassy knoll. And mm. then they started saying all the shots came from behind from this building called the Texas School Book Depository. And I remember I was already a journalist. So I was the editor of a school paper, and I, I had sold a magazine article, and my parents were journalists, and so I had some good instincts. And one instinct I always have is when a story is changed by the authorities without a good, really good explanation, an alarm bell goes off, you know. So I thought, wait a second, they've changed the direction of the shots. It made me, uh, mm-hmm. by the end of the day, I was not believing the official story. I, I believed Oswald when he said, I'm just a patsy. And when he gave it, mm-hmm. it was just, I shot nobody yet. But anyway, I, I like a lot of people, you know, I followed it for a while and I was kind of swayed by the Warren report. But then when those books started coming out in 1966, they were questioning it. I started questioning the case again. I wrote a letter to a newspaper about that, but I didn't really get into, I mean, I, I studied it all through the 70s and the House Select Committee, Watergate and um the revelations about the CIA really opened my mind up to conspiracy as it did for a lot of people that we could see our government in a different way. But it wasn't right. 1982 that I thought, okay, I will study the Tippett case and the Kennedy case and write a book about it. And uh, But I had focused by then on Tippett, you know, as I said, that I realized that needed studying. But I was also going to study, you know, what I knew about the Kennedy case because there are a lot of loose ends even today a lot of people have come up with important discoveries, but there are things that are still debated and uh, questionable. But uh, so sure. the, into the nightmare it took 30 years to write from 82 to 2013, and I was I was doing other things at the time, writing other books and uh, teaching from the year 2009. But you know, I was every day, and even today, I'm I'm still reading about it every day and studying it and. And then I wrote a second book on it. So I, I spent 30 years on that book. And I, I went to Dallas, uh, I guess it was three times during that period. And I spent a, a, a good long time there for, in 92 to 93. And I interviewed a lot of important people, including, as I mentioned, the DA, Henry Wright, and James Lavell, the detective, and other people, and, and policemen. One person I interviewed, um, going back to Sean's point about the Ku Klux Klan, I interviewed a guy named Morris Boley, who was Tippett's oldest friend in the police department. He, he and Tippett were from the same little town in East Texas during the Depression, you know. And so I thought I'd, I'd want to hear about how they grew up and what it was like. And, you know, so this guy was just kind of, you know, 
country fellow and I was having lunch with him in a diner and had the tape recorder on the table in front of us. And he pulled out his wallet and he showed me his Ku Klux Klan membership card. Wow. In my mind, it was signed by the Grand Dragon and all this. And wow. I said, oh. Oh, you know, one thing you do when you're a reporter is you keep a straight face and just keep people talking. And, you know, right. you, the main job of an interviewer is get people talking. And and my friend Errol Morris, who's a great filmmaker, made the Thin Blue Line. His theory is you should talk as little as possible. He said, anybody, you let somebody talk for 30 minutes, they will show you how crazy they really are. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Life, you know. So Morris Brumley, you know, I, I, I didn't want to say, what, you were a clan, clansman, you know. So I just said, oh, really? And what were you doing in the clan? And he said he was infiltrating the clan on behalf of the Dallas police. And then he started bragging in a really horrible way about how they would castrate black men. Oh, man. He was laughing about it. And I, 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 then I, I couldn't control myself. I finally said, I tried to keep it. Matter of fact, I said, well, when you're infiltrating the Klan, did you report some of these crimes? You know, But that uh -huh. shut up. That, you know, that he got the point of the question. <laughs> He stopped talking about, but that's that's how ugly it got. And I mentioned that to another researcher in Dallas who had been around for a long time, and he laughed. He said, infiltrating the Klan, he said three fourths of the Dallas Klan were Dallas policemen. Right? Were they all were they all infiltrating? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joe, th then let me ask you a follow up. In in all of those years that you were investigating and researching this this particular murder, um, what like forensic or hard evidence have you uncovered that links Oswald to, to the murder? To the Tippett murder or the Kennedy murder? Or the, the Tippett murder. None, none really. Wow. So, so somehow you've been doing this for, for 30 years and the Dallas police knew within minutes <laughs> that Oswald had killed Tippett and, and knew exactly where to find him. It just shows how ridiculous the whole thing, you know, really is. And, and, you know, they charged him with the murder later that night or, you know, that evening or, or whatever. And, you know, what, with, with what we know about forensics and, and homicide investigations today, I mean, it takes days and weeks, sometimes months and years to, to find, you know, to, for, for the police to feel confident enough to charge somebody with a homicide. Uh, it's just, it blows your mind. It's just unbelievable. Uh, Sean, what, <laughs> what yeah, do you it, think? It's incredible, Joe. But in in all your research, you know, you you see that Tippett's in the orbit of a lot of people that that's involved in some shady stuff, and and members of the Klan and in the John Birch Society. But did you ever find any direct connection between uh, Tippett in the Klan and Tippett in the the John Birch Society? I looked for that, and, uh, and I must say, I never found any specific indication he was a racist or Klansman or all right note or anything uh there, you know people would speculate but you know right. i tried to keep speculation out of my book i left out a few things that are you know people say one thing or another that i left out but because there's no evidence but i tried really hard to be to only report things that were clear but there are things that are still question marks about Tippett. um however you know he, he moved in that milieu he was uh uh austin uh, Cook told me, for example, that he knew Edwin Walker, the general who was a right-wing right. uh, fanatic, lived in Dallas. Kennedy had fired him. He sure. Was, and they uh, tried to blame Oswald for shooting at him. He was indoctrinating troops with uh, John Birch Society literature. And, right. And uh, he was a bitter enemy of Kennedy. And the Warren Commission claimed that Oswald had fired a shot at Walker, but that's that's not provable. Um, no. Not at all. The only witness saw two people at the scene. Right. And anyway, but um, but Walker was, uh, Austin Cook said, yeah, um, you know, I, I knew the general and I went to uh, some events and he did. And, and so these the milieu was, uh, that's what Tippett moved in. And, and he, he was, uh, a lot of policemen were corrupt and Tippett had the opportunity, at least, to be corrupt. Um, and he did come into money. You know, I tried to track 
that kind of thing. Uh, also, for example, um, when Tippett was shot, um, there was a fund that was put together to uh, help his widow and children. And uh, the stories came out, this poor guy, uh, you know, his widow only had a $435, uh, uh, well, he only had a salary of $435. And she was very bitter that the police stopped his uh, his salary at one thirty that afternoon. Can you believe that? I mean, they stopped wow. his Wow. Jeez. Uh, kept him on for a while to help this poor woman. She yeah. Money, and so people poured money into them. And I did some research. It was reported in the press. And I, I kept a record of all the sums that people gave. And some well-known people like Walter Annenberg, who became uh, an ambassador for Nixon later, gave he paid off the mortgage on their home, for example. Uh, and Abraham Zapruder gave $25,000 to Mrs. Tippett. And, um, but in the Dallas police records, which were opened in the 90s, they had a big file of um, donations to the Tippett family. And I started going through them and writing down all the sums. And the woman who was the archivist for the city said to me, well, that has nothing to do with these shooting of Tippett or the assassination. I didn't want to say to her, I think it was kind of a payoff in a way. Yeah. Like if you're involved, mm -hmm. for example, with the underworld and you get killed, uh, it's supposed to uh, help the widow and the orphans, you know? And so, uh, I, yeah. you know, obviously a lot of the <clears throat> citizens generously giving money to Mrs. Tippett, but um, some of them were prominent people. And the fund was quite large, but what was interesting was the amount of money that was supposedly donated to her was a lot more than I could account for. I couldn't account for more than, I, you know, I, I don't have the fig all the figures in my head, but maybe like a, a fifth of what was reported. And then oddly enough, her lawyer was Eugene Locke, who was the head of the Democratic Party in Texas. He became her lawyer. And the parade route which I think was very important to the killing. I did a lot of research on who planned the parade route to go that dog leg down Elm Street, which was against all the Secret Service regulations. You don't make a sharp turn, which reduces the speed of the car to 11.5 miles per hour. It's not, the car was not supposed to go below 25 miles an hour. And um, how did they plan that? It was planned in the office of Eugene Locke on November November fourteenth. Wow, and, interesting. You know, it was Kennedy's uh, chief of staff, in effect. He was called the appointment secretary, but he was basically the chief of staff. He was the key guy in planning the the motor paper. and wow. I finding evidence that Kenny O'Donnell was involved with this plot. And I mean, this this is this really kind of shocked me. Um, very few people have picked up on this, but I had I had my my proof in the in the book. Um, Kenny O'Donnell was regarded by most people as a loyal Kennedy guy, but he had turned against Kennedy, and he was known to be bad mouthing Kennedy. And um, he was going to be fired on Monday, the twenty fifth, back in Washington, because uh, according to Seymour Hirsch um, in his book on the Kennedys, which is somewhat unreliable, but in this yeah. case. He had a good source, Paul, Paul Corbin, who was an operative who worked for the Kennedys. And he said that Kenny O'Donnell had been caught skimming money, campaign funds, embezzling from the campaign. And Robert Kennedy and JFK had told Corbin to conduct an investigation. And they brought the evidence to them. And they said, well, we got to fire the guy. So uh, O'Donnell, I, I think, was the inside man. Every plot needs an inside man. Wow. Also, Secret Service, as Vince Palomara and other researchers have shown, this, there were several Secret Service agents who were involved in the plot. You know, uh, the, one of the things you have to do if you're going to kill a leader, you usually have to involve the security apparatus. Sure. You know, like when Indira Gandhi was killed by her bodyguards, for example. You know, who? How do you kill a leader? You have to get really close to the leader, and you have to corrupt some of the bodyguards, and they did that in the Kennedy case, and I think O'Donnell uh, participated, and, and that choice of the motorcade route was fatal, but it was in the office of Locke, who becomes Mrs. Tippett's um, 
lawyer, which is really strange. And oh. uh, also Mary Farrell, who's known as an important Kennedy researcher, went to work as the secretary for Locke. And um, I think Mary Farrell is an agent. Ken Jones told me, don't trust Mary Farrell. She was she had intelligence agent written all over her. And she, she was like the clearinghouse in Dallas. Everybody was supposed to talk to Mary Farrell when you went to Dallas. And I called her up. I, I was a little suspicious of her, but I called her. I wanted some information. And she started quizzing me a lot. And she she was um, she 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 double crossed me. I, I told her something and I said, please don't tell people. And then she told people this. And, and she wouldn't talk to me then after that. And um, so anyway, Mrs. Farrell, uh, I think, was uh, she, she was the intelligence community's uh, spy on the researchers. Uh, wow. So was, of, Joe, was Locke also the guy that bought the houses up around the Tippett shooting? Different fellow. There was an attorney who lived on 10th Street who, who bought several of the houses and tore right. them not too long after the Tippett killing and changed the the terrain of the uh, shooting uh, and, and put up some, you know, multi-apartment houses. And now today, when you go there, it looks totally different. It's been all changed. They've turned down most of the houses. A couple of the houses are still there, but the street has been changed. They've, they've blocked off part of the street and there's a high school expansion there. And uh, unlike, you know, it's good that Dallas has kept the Texas School Book Depository as it was. There were some people who wanted to tear that down, but fortunately they didn't prevail. But <clears throat> the Tippett murder scene is almost unrecognizable when you go there. You know, I went there once. I was in a film and I walked the filmmakers through the shooting scene and, and Oswald going to the theater and all that. And I had photographs. So we had to kind of look at the photos to figure out exactly where Tippett was shot, et cetera. They make it hard to research that. Wow. Joe, let me ask you this. You, you mentioned the uh, researcher John Armstrong earlier. In, um, John, in John's work, he puts a lot of suspicion on two Dallas police uh, officers, uh, Captain Westbrook and uh, Sergeant Croy. Um, Kenneth Croy. How do you, how do you feel about those two? Because um, Westbrook is suspicious because he ends up going to Vietnam, training their secret police over there. And and Croy is in the when Jack Ruby shoots Oswald, Croy is standing pretty close to to them in the basement. So how do you feel about Armstrong? Even says that he he feels that those two could have possibly been the two cops to pull up to the rooming house and, and beep the horn and give a signal to Oswald. But he thinks they were involved in, in the tip of murder. What do you feel about that? You know, I, I'm familiar with Armstrong's ongoing research you know, after he did his wonderful book, Harvey and Lee, which I, I am just amazed at the research. He spent 10 years in yeah. research tracking down documents. He's, he's sort of modest. He says, you know, I just tracked down documents that were publicly available and nobody had bothered to do this, but he, he just he found out that Oswald was going to schools in different cities at the same time. I mean, that was one of the mm -hmm. most remarkable things. That, I'll just tell you, the listeners will find this fascinating, that the morning after the assassination, FBI agents contacted the Fort Worth Middle School and wanted the uh, assistant principal to meet them. And they went there and they, they looked up the records for Oswald and he gave them the records and, and they've never been seen again. Oswald was supposedly, he was attending that middle school uh, when he was uh, younger. And, but the thing is, at the same time, he was attending a school in New Orleans, you know. Right. So that's among the many proofs that there were two Oswalds being run as, you know, an intelligence project. But anyway, Armstrong has gotten really deeply into the Pacific case, and partly because of my book, uh, you know, helped move things along. One of the things that I focus on is there was a police car in the alley there, Tippett, right. Let me just get the Tippett murder scene picture up there again. Tippett pulled up his car um, right in front of a driveway. Um, there we are. Uh, let's see. You can see Tippett pulled up his car in front of a driveway there where these people are standing. Right. The driveway. And there, there, was a, uh, there were two witnesses who said they saw a police car in that driveway. And the police car backed away after the shooting and, and went off, you know, 
uh, through another path to Patton and uh, on to Jefferson. And um, who was in the police car? Kenneth Croy was a reserve officer. He was in uniform. A reserve officer was not allowed to carry a gun, at least officially. But he was at the scene immediately. And <laughs> officially, the um, uh, story is that no policeman showed up until I think it was 119. You know, Tippett was shot right. around 106, 108, 109. Tippett apparently called. One thing I, I differ with. Armstrong on Tippett, at least somebody using his radio called the dispatcher twice at 108 and they didn't respond. So he might have been alive at 108. You know, he might have been trying to, when you pull somebody over, you're supposed to say, I'm pulling. Oh, him. Right, sure. And so it, it could have been 108, 109. That's what Greg Lowry and um, Larry Ray Harris thought were the, the time frame of the shooting. But anyway, um, a lady. Uh, Doris Holland saw this police car in the, in the alleyway. And uh, anyway, there was a lady in the corner house, Virginia Davis, who came running out of her house when the shots were fired, like immediately. And she told the Warren Commission, police were already on the scene. You know? And the policeman who was there was Kenneth Croy, by all uh, accounts, you know, this, this uh, reserve officer character. And um, um, Westbrook, William Westbrook was the head of personnel. And as Armstrong points out, it's odd for the head of personnel to be running around investigating a homicide. But the personnel uh, chief is the guy who knows all the policemen, knows their histories, he knows their problems, he investigates complaints, et cetera. He would have known everything about Tippett and he would have access to uh, officers, you know. So Westbrook, um, may have been this policeman in this car. He was in plain clothes that day. And Armstrong has constructed a very elaborate um, route where he, he believes, and he has pretty good hypothesis, I think, that um, Westbrook was running around uh, helping to implicate Oswald at the shooting. For example, uh, quote, discovering the jacket. There was a lot of chicanery involved. The in the two wallets jacket and there was a wallet yeah westbrook showed up with a wallet uh and it, it's not clear who gave the wallet to westbrook or croy but they were they were filmed uh by a local uh cameraman for a tv station examining a, an oswald wallet at the scene of the tippet killing uh and there's an fbi agent who showed up there and he said they had the Heidel identification in that wallet, and uh, the wallet never entered evidence. It was not entered into evidence, which is suspicious. Then they find another wallet, supposedly on Oswald at the theater, that has the Heidel information, but Armstrong believes the Heidel uh, cards were planted later after they linked the rifle to Heidel slash Oswald. You know, it gets very complicated, but he, he identifies Westbrook as the key figure in this whole conspiracy to to make Oswald the Patsy, which I think he was. And um, according to um, uh, witnesses, um, after the person who shot Tippett shot him from across the car length, you know, from across the hood, uh, Tippett falls, and then uh, the person went over and fired a shot into his head at close range, a coup de grace as the hustle wow. to make sure he's dead. And then that person went back, uh, either he went back to the police car or he ran around the corner. This is where the witness witnesses uh, diverge. And if there were two people involved, you know, there, there's all kinds of choreography that was complicated and, and various people were lying to, and I spent a lot of time trying to sort that out. And I also, in my book, Into the Nightmare, I go into various suspects who've been named and I try to see if there's substance to them possibly being the tip of shooter or clearing these suspects. Yeah, Joe, let's let's take one last break and then I want to get into this couple of those suspects. I wanted to name, uh, we'll get into some of them. That's Enough Out of You is sponsored by Carfecta. Scranton's premier destination for finding the vehicle of your dreams. With a commitment to service, value, and selection, Carfecta is your trusted partner in every step of your auto purchase journey. 
Our sales staff will work with you to select the perfect vehicle from our diverse inventory. Our friendly office staff will assist you in securing financing and offering warranties. At Carfecta, our dedicated team is here to make your car buying experience seamless and satisfying. Located in Scranton, Pennsylvania at 220 South 7th Avenue or call us at 272-770-0080 and check us out on Facebook. With years of experience serving the area, our dealership is dedicated to offering high quality pre-owned vehicles to our customers. From the moment you walk through our door, we're committed to providing you with a great car buying experience. With our skilled sales staff and financing options, we'll help you get the vehicle you want at the great price you deserve. Visit Carfecta today and let us exceed your expectations. Are you thinking about selling your house? Well, Bob Connors, a realtor at Christian Saunders Real Estate says, I can't sell your house, but I sure as heck can market it and get it from sell to sold. Call Bob today for great marketing and to get a ton of eyeballs on your house. Are you in the market to buy a home? Not sure where to start. If it looks like something you shouldn't buy, Bob's gonna tell you that. Think you can't buy a house or have no idea where to start? Been there, done that. Bob will get you going in the right direction. You can reach Bob at 570-614-3624 or 570-335-9000. And you can find Bob on Facebook at Bob Connors Realtor. Whether you call Bob or not, please remember, stay awesome all you awesome humans and be kind to each other. Bob Connors, the realest real estater. And thanks to Bob Connors and Christian Saunders Real Estate for sponsoring That's Enough Out of You. Um, and one of the things, Joe, before we get into some of these suspects, uh, getting back to Westbrook and Croy, one of the things Armstrong said is that a critical time period, 1230 to, to about 105, 110, um, he can't put, there's no official record of where Croy and Westbrook really were. So their time is kind of unaccounted for in this very critical, you know, right before the, the, the murder at Tippett. Yeah. I mean, you know, some, some preposterous stories you know like Menzel the guy who was racing around Oak Cliff with Pippa trying to find Oswald claimed he was um having lunch at the time you know he heard the Kennedy was shot so he, what, what's his reaction he goes to lunch which is kind of crazy but he told Mrs. Tippett that he was involved in a car accident didn't get to the scene and JD got to the scene and unfortunately was killed that's what he told her and I found that there was a car accident um, about two blocks away, right around uh, in that time frame that maybe Mensel either had the accident or, or uh, he's, he supposedly was assigned to, to um, re- study the accident, you know, do the report on it. And he cleared the scene in four minutes, which is kind of hard to believe if, you, if you're there to report an accident. Yeah. But, it's similarly, Croy had this incredible story that he claimed he was uh, driving his car downtown, and he his his former wife pulled up alongside of him, and they agreed to go for, to lunch. Yeah, he was to go to lunch, Austin's barbecue. <laughs> well, Kennedy is killed, and and he also said he was at the Texas School Book Depository, and he said to the officers, "Do you need any help?" And they said, "No, no, no," you know. No, yeah. there's nothing going on that they need. They need. They didn't need any extra help. <laughs> Unbelievable. At all that day, and um, his wife comes happens to come along. I mean, this is a fairy tale, you know. And then he also said he went home and changed his clothes at his parents' house where he lived, which is absurd too. But anyway, uh, uh, all this was. And Armstrong makes a strong case that this is just a subterfuge to cover up what Croy was doing in Oak Cliff. He was probably one of the policemen involved in the Tippett killing, and he was there at the scene when uh, Virginia Davis came out right after Tippett was shot. And Westbrook uh, put out a weird, phony story, too, that he was in his office at the police station downtown, and he heard about the shooting, and then he walked all the way to the Texas School Book Plus story, yeah. which is absurd. He could have commandeered a After car. After can't get a car. Can't get a car, and he was kind of dallying around listening to radios and stuff. And, and then he... Uh, he, uh, he he drove to uh, the Tippett scene. Um, he, he claimed he 
commandeered somebody else's car. He, he didn't want to make it look like it was his car. He had a car, according to Armstrong, and he went to the scene and he did a lot of stuff. You know, Armstrong goes into great detail on this. But I think he makes a good case that Westbrook and Croy were there and they were up to no good planning evidence and framing Oswald. But where I um, differ with Armstrong is he, he thinks Oswald shot Tippett, you know, the, he says, you know, as I mentioned, there were the second two, Oswald, right? There's two Oswalds, right? Also, Lee uh, uh, and Harvey arrested that we all know was he calls it Harvey, and right. there it's a lot of records call that fellow Harvey Lee Oswald, and uh, then the other guy is Lee Harvey Oswald, and they're different people according to Armstrong and. Uh, he thinks Lee, who vanished after the assassination, shot Tippett, and with the connivance of these two policemen. And uh, I, I don't see any evidence of that because Armstrong himself has proved that the, the gun that supposedly shot Tippett couldn't be linked to uh, Oswald. Right. Whose gun was it? You know, it was probably planted on oswald at the at the theater you know it was probably a fake uh throw what they call that a throw down gun you know when policemen plant a gun at a crime scene but they planted the gun on him at the theater and uh he didn't own a gun and he said he, i did, i don't own a gun i don't own a rifle you know and armstrong himself proves that oswald was telling the truth he didn't own a weapon let me ask you this, Joe. We know Westbrook would end up afterwards over in Vietnam. Do we know what happened with Croy? Where, where did Croy end up? Well, he was he had quite an interesting kind of checkered life. He was a rodeo cowboy, among other things, and <laughs> ran certain businesses. And Armstrong, you know, I, I you know, I, I thought Croy seemed kind of like a dumb guy. Why would they involve him? But um Armstrong thinks Croy was a pretty ambitious character, you know, at least for money. You know, money is a strong motive for corruption. Mm -hmm. And he had very various business ventures that he got involved in and, he, and uh, various things like that. And uh, so he was uh, kept kind of a low profile, but he was, he was uh, busy with uh, various uh, businesses. Let's talk about some of the suspects you had in the book. Uh, let's start with William Seymour. Yeah, I, I don't know much about him. There's been a lot of talk about him. He's one of the people involved with anti-Castro Cubans. Right. I don't see connections with him in the Tippett going. There was a fellow named Daryl Garner, who I think is a more interesting suspect. Okay. He was a um, crony of Ruby. He was a young man. He died at the age of 30 of a heroin overdose soon after the assassination. And Garner was a, a petty criminal. Uh, who was a pimp and uh, uh, you know a, a burglar and various things. And he gave a long interview to Mark Lane at one point, the assassination researcher, and uh, Lane was considering being his attorney. And it's a, quite an interview. Uh, you can find it in Armstrong's papers at Baylor online. Um, he claims that Oswald and Ruby were uh, not only um, friends, but homosexual partners goes into detail and that there are other people who claim that too. Right. But it says that he was uh, asked by Clay Shaw, who uh, Garrison. Right. Excluded. Clay Shaw wanted to recruit him to help kill Kennedy. And he goes into a lot of stuff that may or may not be true. But Garner was the guy who was a suspect in the shooting of Warren Reynolds. Reynolds was a man who was standing about a uh, around the corner from the Tippett shooting, about a block away up on Jefferson, he was working for a car lot, and he saw the uh, shooter or one of the shooters running away, and he followed him, and um, you know he followed him carefully from a distance. He didn't want to get shot, but he wouldn't identify him as Oswald, so they um, they didn't take him seriously, and then. Um, in January of 64, the FBI interviewed Warren Reynolds, and he said, again, I can't identify the shooter as Oswald. And the next day, somebody shot Warren Reynolds in the head in his uh, business, and he miraculously survived a head wound. Wow. And, and he wow. said, oh, yeah, it was Oswald. He changed his story because he wanted to. 
And uh, that's an example of a witness tampering in a big way. Um, like Benavides, I mentioned that he changed his story after his brother was killed. And, and uh, Emil D'Antonio, who was a great documentary filmmaker who made Rush to Judgment with Mark Lane, I knew D'Antonio. He said in an interview at the time, when they went to Dallas to, to do the film, he said all the tension was at the tippet scene. Dealer Plaza was very relaxed. People were happy to talk. But everybody around the Tippett scene was extremely tense. And Benavides had agreed to an interview. And, and the police told them, don't talk to these guys. And, you know, there's a lot of cover up surrounding the Tippett murder. And uh, I mentioned Lavelle and his fellow cops didn't really investigate the murder of their brother officer. And that's strange. And, you know, I talked to Lavelle. He claimed that, it, yeah, I kept, you know, looking into it. But they really dropped the case when Oswald was shot. It was convenient to, to peg it on Oswald, you know. Right. And they didn't really follow up. And Mrs. Clements, who was this uh, black lady who was working as a domestic half a block away, she said she saw two men at the shooting, neither of whom was Oswald, and they were running in different directions. And one was short and kind of heavy and curly haired and uh, the other was tall and thin and she was visited by um she said a policeman came to visit her and showed her his gun and, and said don't talk or something you might get killed on the way to work wow and shut up and but this woman was very brave and gave some interviews and unfortunately was never seen again after lane and d'antonio interviewed her on film for rush to judgment you can see her interview on youtube and she tells the truth and she's a gutsy lady. I think the only heroes in this case are the witnesses, the civilians who came forward um, to, to you know, tell the truth uh, because they were concerned about what happened right. to her lies. You know, and, and so um, she was intimidated and uh, disappeared and uh, I and other people tried to find her. We could never find her. But Garner, Garner, anyway, Garner may have been uh, the temperature. That's he seems like a strong possibility. He was connected with Ruby. He was, uh, by his own account, uh, by own character. And uh, he was the main suspect in the Warren Reynolds shooting. And his alibi was his girlfriend, Betty McDonald, who was a Jack Ruby stripper. She said he was with her that night. And then she was arrested on a kind of trumped up charge of a fight with her roommate. And uh, she hanged her, allegedly hanged herself by her pants in the jail. Wow. Shortly after being arrested, you know, a lot of the witnesses and uh, people, peripheral people, uh, met uh, strange deaths. You know, Penn Jones was the guy who first called attention. Right. To and um, so, you know, here's Garner. He claimed he was in Las Vegas when Kennedy and Tippett were shot. And, and, um, but then this whole thing with, um, oh, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, he's, he claimed he was in Las Vegas when Warren Reynolds was shot. And this Betty McDonald gave the alibi and then she died mysteriously. And then he dies soon after that. And he said he was being harassed by Captain Will Fritz. So I think he's a possible suspect. There was also a strange character named Igor Paganoff who was yeah. roaming around Dallas. He came from Pennsylvania. To Dallas um, and was uh, seen around Oak Cliff that day behaving mysteriously. There was also talk, I mentioned that Steve Thompson, who was the estranged husband of Johnny Maxie Witherspoon, might have killed Tippett as a jealous husband. Uh, there was uh, Mrs. Uh, Thompson, who later married a man named Witherspoon, she became pregnant um, around that time. And she she learned that she was pregnant right around that time. And uh, one theory is that she told J.D. that she was pregnant and she you know, she was vague on one subject. When was the last time she saw J.D. and where was she living at the time of the shooting? She was very cagey and wouldn't tell me. But some people think J.D. was living at the house you see behind me there, behind this policeman on the left, there's a house there. Uh, the Davis sisters said that J.D. lived in that house, and he may have been uh, shacked up there with the mistress. And But Mrs. Witherspoon said she lived uh, some blocks away. 
But um, I tried to investigate the husband as a possible suspect, and I don't think he was uh, involved. He was at work, uh, you know, and um, Greg Lowry thought this was a red herring introduced to yeah. mislead people. Um, although he threatened a researcher when the researcher tried to confront him with uh, the question. But Mrs. Witherspoon had this child, and um, Steve Thompson thought the baby was Tippett's child. Uh, this uh, girl was born in 1964, Susan. And uh, but Mrs. Witherspoon told me that she was the baby was not Tippett's because Tippett had a vasectomy, she said. Wow. And mm. they, Vasectomies were not pretty not common back in '63, but they were being done, you know. But that's that's another strange part of the story that Tippett had this active, scandalous life going on. Another reason, uh, I mean, Lavelle kind of hinted to me the one reason that they covered up a lot about Tippett was that it was scandalous and uh, would have uh, embarrassed his family and embarrassed the police department. And then he said something like. Uh, he said, hell, if uh, if we uh, uh, arrested every policeman who was screwing around, uh, half the policemen in America would be under arrest. You know? See. You know, yeah. Cynical bunch, the Dallas boys. Yeah, there's something. They, they, were, they weren't embarrassed about being part of the Klan, but they were oh. embarrassed about that, I guess. Well, huh? yeah, we'll it. <laughs> I was amazed. Uh, you know, the tape recorder is sitting on the uh, table and he pulls out his wallet and he, you know, he shows me his membership card. He was proud of it. Wow. <sighs> Interesting. Wow. Crazy. Well, Joe, I, we, we've taken up a, a lot of your time. We really appreciate, um, you know, all the, all the time you've given us today. I know Sean, I'm sure there's a lot more we want to get into, uh, your, your, um, your recent book, political truth, the, the media, uh, and the assassination of President Kennedy, I, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll we'll want to have you back to talk about that at some point. And also, Sean and I are, are you know, big movie buffs. So we, we'd love to have you back and pick your brain about movies and, you know, being a being a historian. And I'm just looking at your at the books uh, that you've written. And uh, one of them caught my eye, the the book of movie lists um, that kind of caught my eye. I'd be interested in, in reading that and kind of, you know, seeing what's what you have in there. A lot of fun with that. Uh, you know, I decided to treat it as a kind of autobiography, and I sort of uh, just was extremely personal with my lists of things that are hang-ups of mine, and like the ten sexiest nuns in movies, you know, things like that. <laughs> the George Cukor book, which is coming out in December, it's called George Cukor's People, Acting for a Master Director. I had a great time doing that. He was such a marvelous director. He did. Films like Philadelphia Story, Camille, A Star is Born with Judy Garland, uh, Sylvia Scarlet with Catherine Hepburn. And I, I decided to write about all the actors who gave great performances in his work because that's what he was uh, known for and that's what his style was. And he's one of, I tend to write books about people who are either underrated or unjustly neglected or misunderstood. And that's true of the Kennedy assassination, too, of course. You know, the Tippett murder is a misunderstood story uh, not covered properly and i wanted to focus attention on that but the political truth uh, i cared about a lot i'd love to talk to you guys about that because uh yeah yeah that'd be great we'll, we'll have you back and and just uh you know i as all the books that i could find the viewers we did put them up on our bookshop so people could uh could purchase them there on our bookshop we'll put the links up well i think that one of the reasons we're in trouble in our country with the tremendous division we have and you know, it's healthy up to a point to distrust the government. You know, I remember when I was a kid, we all trusted the government, and then we started being disillusioned by the Vietnam War and things. But it, that started with the assassination. That's what political truth goes into. And that's what led step by step to this state we're in now, where half the country believes one thing and half the country believes something else, and nobody can agree. And, and yeah. We're violent about this. And, 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 and if your country does not tell the truth about its own history, that's what happens. You yes. Run into chaos. And yeah. So about that. And, you know, I, I read about Kennedy assassination. The path to January 6, 2021 is, is clear in, in my book. And that hasn't been discussed in the mainstream media because they don't like to draw those kind of connections when it's true. Right. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And, you know, when you have a mainstream media that's kind of controlled by a, a single entity, um, you know, t- <laughs> they tend to uh, they tend to write the narrative. Um, so, you know, we, we don't we don't get, you know, what what really happened. We don't get the truth most of the time or we get pieces of it. Uh, magazines and book companies and TV uh, networks and big newspapers, there are very few media corporations tend to own a lot of these entities. And uh, so it's the power is concentrated. And that's something that's happened over the last 30 or 40 years. It used to be companies were mom and pop companies owned by families and things. And the New York Times is still owned by a family, but you know, a lot of other ones are part of corporations, especially the TV networks and, and um, you know, other things like that. And, and so that's one of the problems is the corporatization of the media makes everybody kind of think alike and, and, and kind of wall out dissident voices. But that's why podcasts are so important. And we also have more freedom of speech in books. Sure. And right. and yep. On the internet than we do in the big newspapers and magazines. Absolutely. That's why we do what we do. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank well, Joe, you. Joe, Joe, thank, yeah, thank you so much. Back. Thank you. I'd love to come back. See you later. Okay. All right. Take Bye. care. Thank you. Bye, Joe. That's Enough Out of You podcast is executive produced and written by Bill Rader and Sean Kane and edited by Bill Rader. The That's Enough Out of You podcast and logo are exclusive property of Bags of Chicken, LLC. Any rebroadcast, retransmission, or accounts of this podcast without the express written consent of Bags of Chicken, LLC is prohibited. So don't even try it.